Welcome back guys to another episode of What's On Your Mind. My name's Chris Quill and today uh, I've got Ben Begreen and Raj Malhotra joining me on the call. Guys, it's always fantastic to have you both on the show. Um, I think, you know, at the moment we're in tricky times with uh, the market and trading through this kind of macro environment that we've got. But, you know, with those tricky times does come a bit of added volatility and uh, potentially opportunities to go with it as well. So I'm, I'm quite interested in what you guys uh, are thinking in terms of the current market environment, how you're trading it, uh, what's going on in your portfolios, and also whether there's any opportunities that you're taking advantage of or that you see for, say, equity ideas uh, going forward. So uh, with that being said, Raj, uh, I'll throw it to you first. Uh, what have you been thinking about? Uh, thank you, Chris. Thanks, Ben. Um, so to say we're in tricky times is a bit of an understatement. Um, whether we're in officially a, a bear market or not, uh, to me, is kind of pointless. You know, the def classic definition is a 20% sell off off the top, which if it's sitting at 17%, 18%, really doesn't matter to me that much. Uh, but to say there is market uncertainty is obvious. Now, one thing that's interesting versus some other big drawdowns is I feel that um, positioning right here is not that long in terms of whether it's hedge funds or investors. A lot of their, um, a lot of them pull capital out of the market. Now, while historically that's been a, uh, could be a bullish indicator, that certainly has not been the case yet. And um, you can't just say because of uh, what's happened in the past will happen again. Um, so having said that, um, as we're sitting in earnings season, there's a lot of tells of, the future per se by certain companies that, and certain companies, as you know, are, or you should know, are much more indicative and have a much more broader uh, reaching. It, it, you can read the tea leaves from certain companies that have a, uh, that indicate what, what the consumer, what the economy, uh, what the market should do versus others. So one of those I want to highlight today is uh, tar to, to me, the, probably the most important one in my mind was target. Versus, um, you know, Target and Walmart both reported last week. Both had similar stories. Walmart for um, Walmart is uh, caters more to the lower end consumer, um, so obviously they were hit by. You would assume that they'd be hit by inflation more, and their spending patterns would change um, a lot given high gas prices and food and inflation and other necessities. Target, on the other hand, is a uh, caters more to the mid to. Um, higher end consumer. So you would assume or you one would might think that they would be a little bit more immune to uh, higher prices, um, given it, higher prices and necessities like oil and gas and oil and gas and food versus um, just because of their higher disposable income. Now, when you go through the earnings, it was a really bad, it could be a bad um, omen for the rest of the, for the consumer and consumer spending patterns going forward. But let's look at the numbers itself, and I'm going to tell you what really jumped out to me on the screen here. So, if you look at their costs or their revenues, this is basically a um, this is the uh, first quarter uh, 2021 versus uh, 2022. So, the their revenues were uh, 24.2 billion in 2021 and 25.2 um, billion in uh, 2022 Q1. Now. In term, now, year over year, that's a 4% increase. Now, while that's not impressive, at first glance, you might think that that's uh, you know, um, an okay increase, nothing exciting, nothing uh, alarming. But the thing is, once you look, when you, go, you think about it, it's actually negative because of inflation. So with inflation at 8%, you know, obviously uh, at Target, there's more than one, they're, they sell hundreds and there's thousands of different types of items. But if it was just one item per se, it, in, in real sales, they sold less units of um, whatever they sell. So that itself, like that, peep, that peep, the uh, mid to high end consumer spending less money um, or buying less items is not a great indicator of the, uh, the confidence of the U.S. consumer and um, the ability for them to spend. Now, when you go further down, you look at... Uh, the cost of sales up 10.4%, the SGNA up 5.6%. Those are two things. No, obviously, higher wages for their employees uh, to pay their employees. That was a drag on their economy. I'm sorry, on their um, bottom line, as well as the inventories uh, build up, which is prop, which was 
which was stated at Walmart, and you'll probably see it at other um, other retailers. Now, the thing that's very interesting on that is, or it should be an alarming to many people, is that Target was probably one of the best run, if not the best run, uh, retail company. So for them to miss so bad on sales that that can be explained away a little bit but the fact that they missed on inventories probably means that other um, retailers will do the same and you know given all that um, it's been a, a terrible last couple of weeks for retail and I really don't think that there's a lot to think of going forward that should turn that in the near term um, having said that a lot of the retail names that I've had um, I've Reduced exposure down here, given the big move. There's a lot of indicators that tells me the market here uh, might be a bit oversold in both this sector plus the uh, broader market. The market indicators are telling me that. But having said that, you know, I would like to add retail shorts to my uh, portfolio um, as the as as what I, if if the market rebounds a bit. So I I do think that um, in terms of the implied recession, I think it's a bit high of what the market's um, pricing in, and it might be overdone. Having said that, um, we don't need re- we don't need a recession for margin compression, and I think we are getting margin compression right here. So, and with er- if earnings should come down to say to last year's uh, earnings, the market probably could still have ten percent downside from here. Um, if you look at the higher end consumer, their names like um, Nordstrom, who actually reported decent earnings. So that's still telling me that the higher, the, the highest end consumer is still doing okay. Although I think if market declines into the market, the broader market continues to decline, that should also um, be affected and then that should come in as well. So long and short of it, I don't love anything in retail right here. Um, I would like to see, um, I'd love, like to get short at higher prices. I was going to, um, I'm not going to highlight a retail specific retail short here because the two I was going to highlight are William Sonoma and Dix. But we're filming this uh, Tuesday, and we're and by the time this goes to uh, uh, the world, uh, those will have already reported. So, um, but having said that, there's a lot of there's a lot in the retail space and consumer space that I'm really looking to uh, that I expect to underperform the rest of the market, even if we don't go into a recession anytime soon. Cool. That, that was pretty interesting to hear about, you know, Walmart as a kind of barometer um, for, for the market environment in the sense that we're in. Uh, on that note, uh, Ben, have you got anything that you wanted to add in terms of your market interpretation at the moment? Yes, I have uh, <clears throat> two charts on here that I wanted to discuss. OK, so there is obviously a lot of talks about macro fundamentals. I mean, that's what the process is all about. So I'm going to shift gears a bit, um, talk about something that's not really discussed that much. Um, I look at it a lot, I find it interesting and useful. So I'm going to bring it up here in this forum. Um, So I do a lot of, you know, coming from a hedge fund world, I do a lot of quantitative studies. um, And part of that is looking at market participation. Okay, so what is... What has gone on with the various indices, S&P, NASDAQ, whatnot, is, is one thing. But what is actually happening with the underlying stocks that make up uh, the market as a whole? I'm not talking about the S&P 500 or the NYSE, just all the stocks, in this case, that's tracked by TradeStation, which is like somewhere between five and 7,000. Um, and, you know, looking at the behavior on the constituent stocks can tell us a lot about what's going on under the hood of the market. So this is market breadth studies. And when people talk about market breadth, um, the kind of street way to to think about it is advanced decline of the New York Stock Exchange. But that is actually just the tip of the iceberg. And the problem with that is that it only tells you what's happening on one particular day. So, The stuff that I look at um, goes much deeper into it and it uh, pertains to data because it's, you know, it looks at historical data as well. So I have have several things to look at, but the two first example is I have the SPY, so the S&P tracker stock on here on both of these. And you can see that they're colored, okay, red and uh, 
green. We'll get into that in a sec. But on the bottom, the first one measures <clears throat> how many stocks are breaking into new yearly highs versus new yearly lows. Okay, and the other one to the right is uh, what percent of stock, what, you know, how many stocks as a percentage are trading above their 50 day moving average. Now, there's nothing magical about the 50 day moving average, okay? It's just a way to uh, describe the behavior of the underlying stocks. You know, are most stocks, uh, you know, in a, in a downtrend or an uptrend? So the two ways to use this is when, uh, when we are in a bull market, we have to have market participation. You need more stocks participating on the upside in order for the market to have legs going higher. Uh, like what we saw, for example, in the market topped end of December, what happened was it, was it occurred with just a handful of big cap stocks that kind of brought it higher. That is just not sustainable. Okay, that's why to the right, on the chart to the right, the red coloring uh, indicates that the indicator at the bottom is in kind of bearish territory, okay? In this case, below 50%. Uh, so even though the market broke out to a new high end of December, this indicator was actually falling because market participation was decreasing. So it's kind of like uh, building a house of cards, you know, and then you have, you're taking away more and more of the cards that make up the foundation and eventually the whole thing does falls apart. So that's one way <clears throat> to use this. Um, another way, which is more interesting um, right now, is as kind of like a, an extreme measure. So when the market has these big sell-offs, kind of like we saw in uh, the COVID sell-off of 2020, uh, it tends to bottom with kind of a crescendo of this panic selling, okay? And we saw that happening actually mid-May. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, this happened in both of these indicators where we got to a level where we only seen this happen about five times in the past 10 years. The last one being at the COVID sell-off. Um, and then you can see on the, on, the, sit on the chart to the right here that we are, <clears throat> This was, this was uh, taken last week, okay? But we are kind of like in a similar state right now where it's sitting at around 15%. So that means that only 15% of stocks are trading uh, above its 50-day average and 85% are trading below. And, you know, these, these, these levels basically mean that, I'm not saying that the market is bottoming, maybe it is, maybe it's not, but the chances are that we are getting close. Okay, because uh, I mean, like Ross said, history it doesn't always repeat itself, but it comes to a point where the sentiment is just so bearish, uh, and then you have a lot of big institutional value players starting to pick up the pieces, and that's what's going to start the initial reaction. Um, so this is data that I you know that I look at um, as supporting data to the macro and fundamental stuff that we you know that we use in the process. Um, so I just thought it was interesting to bring this up. So anyway, um, this kind of leads into a long idea. So I found a couple of ideas last week, and um, one of them is a long, and I was thinking, you know, about uh, a higher beta name to take advantage of a potential rebound in the market, but then I decided to be... Uh, you know, a little more uh, conservative in this environment because, uh, you know, who knows? Um, so I'm looking at a company that produces something that most people in the world consume uh, maybe on a daily basis, which is eggs, straight up eggs, shell eggs, actually. So this is Calm Food, C-A-L-M. Okay, ticker is Calm. <clears throat> and it's the largest producer and distributor of eggs in the United States. Um, they offer a lot of specialty eggs, uh, kind of like nutritionally enhanced, cage-free, organic. Uh, and in a, on the store shelf, you'll see them as uh, Egglands, Best, Land O'Lakes, Farmhouse, and they have other like private label brands. And um, they have been around <clears throat> since 1957. So they've be definitely been able to survive various market conditions. Uh, but it's still a pretty small company, uh, $2.3 billion market cap. Uh, but it's a relatively simple business, you know, that uh, 
is kind of easier to focus on and understand in a turbulent economy, um, which we obviously are in. So really, um, when I started looking at this, so first of all, my daughter, she, uh, she raises her own chickens, so I get eggs for free, which is cool. But um, in that process, I had to learn a bit about chickens and eggs, okay? So they, the company is involved in the egg process as far as, in all, in all aspects, as far as production, uh, grading, packaging, marketing, uh, distribution, and whole nine yards. And they also hatch their own chicks and uh, deal with their own feed and everything. So, so they have flocks then of what's called pullets, layers, and breeders. Right, so pullets are the female uh, chickens that are small, they're younger than 18 weeks old. And layers, they are the mature chickens that lay the eggs. And breeders are both male and female chickens that are used to produce the fertile eggs. So basically they are the chickens that have all the fun. That's just how it goes. Um, so, you know, and they also manufacture their own feed and handled eggs from the time they're laid until they are delivered to the customer. So the KPIs then of this business uh, is egg pricing, feed cost, and volumes of eggs sold. And egg pricing depends on, uh, hugely on demand in itself. And coming out of COVID, uh, demand has picked up because a lot of their um, products are sold commercially to restaurants. You know, so, and that's on pace to getting back to pre-pandemic levels in the food service industry, especially special to eggs. So special to eggs is a <clears throat> pretty key driver here. Um, they accounted for 30% of all revenue this past quarter versus 26% last year. Okay, so special to eggs um, is definitely an important factor. And they sell, and that's because they sell at a fairly big premium. You know, if you go to the store and buy uh, just your basic eggs, it's really, really cheap. So this is a way to sell them at a significant premium by, you know, nutritionally enhanced, <laughs> if you want to call it. Um, but one, one concern though with that, okay, is that specialty eggs also require uh, kind of a higher grade feed, which is more expensive than traditional eggs. And feed cost has increased a lot with inflation uh, because most of the feed cost is in uh, corn, soybeans, and other grains, which you know has had a huge um, rally, obviously, past not even not even just the past six months because of Russia, but you know also before that. Um, because it's really related to export demand, weather uh, related issues um, and uh, production yields. Okay, and all that can uh, squeeze the margins. Um, now, the risk of the feed prices rising can be controlled if you're, if you're able to manage the other expenses well, which they have been. Um, so if you look at, I have a chart here of uh, corn futures. Okay, so corn is a big component of the feed in this case. And corn futures are up over 300% since August of 2020. Uh, however, even though, uh, you know, you think like, okay, so, you know, Russia is the largest exporter of grains in the world. So obviously that's had an effect, but even so corn actually topped end of April and it's been falling since. Okay. So there is a sense that if you look at also what's happening in the dollar, which is reversed and treasury, uh, prices trading higher, which is pressuring and putting downward pressure on yields. There is a sense, if you pay attention to these market forces, that inflation might be overdone. Um, and this could be, at least for now, a potential lead on uh, a lot of some of these grains like corn, soybeans, and wheat. And if and if the and if the prices of feed comes down, it's a uh, it's a pretty big deal for this company. All right, so. I'm gonna have a, gonna have a deeper look at the fundamentals, but in order to see it, uh, put it kind of put it in perspective. I have it on the graph here. This is a monthly graph of calm going back almost 20 years, and the reason why I have that is because you really need to look further back to appreciate this growth story. Uh, back in 2006 to 2016, revenues grew from uh, 400 million 
to two billion in ten years. So that's that's pretty huge, and uh, that is the kind of light blue line you see laid on top of the price this price graph. Um, then a kind of flat line, you know, for the past you know five six years or so, um, and now it looks like there's a good chance it's going to have another pop higher. Uh, earnings per share in this case have been quite volatile. Um, that's because of the you know commodities that they are dependent on, well, feed costs, that has been a little bit all over the place. Uh, so this is really a revenue growth story. And also coincidentally, for the technical uh, people out there, you can see that it's also formed kind of a major bullish wedge that it broke out of not too long ago. Uh, and now the stock is pulled back down to 45 support. This is a uh, data from uh, last week, as long as look at this. Um, so, but additionally, one, one big thing <clears throat> in this environment with rising rates that you need to pay attention to is the balance sheet. Okay, and on this graph, I have long-term debt at the bottom. That's that red line at the bottom. And um, it has fallen to practically zero. So even when the company had a 400% uh, revenue growth over 10 years <clears throat> with higher debt, now debt is zero. So you know if they're able to do that with a higher debt load, they can uh, most likely do it again. So that's kind of the, the thesis here. And um, you know, in a typical kind of bullish market um, with stable rates or even falling rates, balance sheets uh, doesn't have, you know, just not as much of an impact. But in this case, in this economy, yes, you definitely want to pay attention to balance sheets now. It's important. Um, so I'm going to look at all this stuff then. I think there's a good chance this stock could get up to 60 by this fall. Um, and I uh, also have the revenue consensus uh, trend up here. And there's been, this isn't, uh, this stock is, isn't followed by a lot of analysts, okay? Because this is not a very exciting company. Um, but nevertheless, you know, we're seeing some solid upside revisions for um, in the past month. In fact, we had 30% upside revisions in uh, next quarter revenue, which is, you know, nice to see. Uh, valuations are kind of, it's, it's, you know, um, in the middle of the aware it kind of should be uh, P's at 22 forward price of sales at 1.2. So it's not definitely not uh, super exciting maybe at this point for some people, but uh, you know what, I'll take safer over exciting in this market. Uh, another catalyst, yes, there's more. There's another catalyst that I like to look at. This um, stock also has 15% short interest as percent of flow with eight days to cover the short. Um, so why do I care? It's because if, there, if this stock starts rallying, there's a pretty good chance shorts are going to have to start covering. And that could add to the rally uh, and cause a significant short squeeze. And, um, you know, obviously that helps. It's kind of like a turbo boost to the upside if it starts going. Um, you know, that and then obviously I think inflation could be peaking here. Um, the feed grains could be over, the price of feed could be overdone. So that should all kind of have a positive impact on margin. So, you know, for these forums that we have here, we can't go too deep into this because we have uh, some time restrictions. So we're going to move straight on to the structure. You know, how would I look at this then? So this options chain that I have on here was pulled last week. Um, it's not super liquid, okay? So we need to be selective. Uh, but I do want to get exposure to the earnings that's going to come out mid-July. But July options basically just have no open interest and pretty wide spreads. So we're going to give this more time, give this um, play more time to work itself out. Um, so looking at the August 45 calls. At this time, the August 45 calls was trading at 450. Um, and then to hedge out some of this time decay out to August, we can uh, short the June 50 strike at a dollar. Uh, hopefully that will expire worthless and then potentially short the August 60 for another dollar, which will put my cost at 250, um, 250 bucks a contract. And if the stock gets to 60 by the August expiry, the 45 strike will then be worth 15 for the net cost of uh, 2.5. So that's a six to one reward risk at that time. Um, 
so yeah, so this is um, this is something I'm um, I'm looking at and um, probably gonna probably gonna kind of work into this over the next few days. Cool. I, I really like that one. I think um, it's a great idea at the moment to be able to find a stock that's sort of in a in a defensive se- sector with some growth opportunities and low debt. Obviously, given what's happening with with interest rates and plenty of catalysts to go with it, and short interest quite high as well. It all sounds really interesting, Ben. Um, Raj, let's go over to you though. What did uh, what did you want to talk about next? Yeah, um, that's a great idea, Ben. Um, so a couple of things I wanted. One thing I really want to talk about was um, you touched on it about commodity prices and um, how there is a fear, and I think it's justified that if inflation does start to revert, you'll see a lot of um, the names that have had big increases reverse hard, particularly in the commodity space. Now, there's a couple of charts um, that I want to show here. Like number one right here, this is the first one in terms of the capex cycle um, for these commodity names versus GDP. As you can see, these businesses um, have never um, really, this is about as low of uh, investment as they've had um, in their businesses for a long time. So, you know, if these uh, long-term cycles are to reverse, um, I just don't see it. Um, I, I would look to add um, to these, uh, the names I've highlighted in the past on weakness, names like Cleveland Cliffs. Um, so we've also highlighted NFE, CNQ, um, Devon Energy, those kind of names, I, I think on a, uh, you know, on a, on a reversal in commodity price and inflation peaking, while you might get some short-term headwinds, um, that might be, that's an opportunity to buy. I mean, if you look at this chart here in terms of the commodities to the equity ratio, this is a very interesting chart. This is never, uh, this is lower than both the, uh, the uh, nifty 50 uh, stock bubble in the seventies and the tech bubble right here. So this is, if you look at as on a relative basis, remember everything you're buying or buying or selling in the market, you're always relative to everything else, right? So in terms of on a relative basis, these companies look cheap and um, should what Ben was talking about actually come to fruition. The knee jerk reaction probably would be to sell these names, but um, I actually think that long-term uh, you know, it, it's probably they're, they're actually in the early, the early innings of a uh, of a uh, still a commodity. Um, the commodity stock should continue to increase. Um, have, so, having said that, in terms of ideas, I do want to touch on one that's not specifically in the commodity space, but has certainly benefited from this inflation and, and commodities the commodities, and I think is a uh, a name that actually has explosive growth, similar to what Ben said, but in a deep value sector. So, you know, as you know, what I've been looking for in addition to, um, I've been looking based on value stocks that are have single digit multiples, but but act like growth stocks because of double digit growth rates. Like I said earlier, I'm not, I don't love um, anything in the consumer space right here. I think, that, I think uh, tech and um, higher growth are now becoming a, a, a tr- at a point where they're tradable. I'm not investable, but tradable. But um, I do think that these uh, names right here, uh, there's there's a specific sector that I, I do like the uh, the shipping industry right here as a uh, a way to play this low uh, PE but high growth uh, trade right here. Uh, if you look at dry bulk shipping, there's been pent up demand because obviously because of the because of the pandemic, but as well as the recent lockdowns and their their cut their consumers um, that that need the uh, dry bulk shippers they have no doubt but they have no choice but they have to accept higher prices so these companies right here are price makers not price takers and if you don't take their price they're just going to go to someone else so they're in, they're in a position where they can basically just set their price so you know the, like these um, these ones are deep value and but again I think these these companies are really going to um, massively um, increase their revenues again, like I said, because they're passing along to customers and including higher fuel prices. But these companies are just basically telling uh, their customers, well, here are higher fuel prices, pay them, and that's it. So what's interesting to me is like, you know, while you might see a, like the bear case on this sector is while you might, while the U.S. might see the lower demand um, due to consumer spending, like Ben just said, people still have to eat. So when you have shortages of grains and other non-ag products, it's going to take a long time to work that way through the system. And therefore, these stocks continue to be, um, 
have superior growth and will continue to benefit from this inflationary environment compared to other stocks um, in the in- index or uh, in the world. So the company that I uh, really like is uh, Zim uh, Integrated Shipping Service, the ticker is ZIM. So this company basically provides shipping and related services uh, internationally. They provide door-to-door and port-to-port transportation services for all their customers, including end users and freight forwarders. They have a, they have a fleet of 118 vessels, um, 110 commercial uh, container uh, vessels, and eight transports. So. In terms of like the performance of the stock, uh, year to date, the stock it, with stock trading around uh, seventy dollars a share, it's up eighteen percent year to date. But the valuation still, like I said, a single digit multiple. It's a PE ratio of around two, yeah, you know, like two, like between one and three. And it's better. It, and their their uh, metrics, in my view, in my mind, are about ninety percent better than much than its sector comps. So. This may be a the stock you should look to uh, trade before the ship sells, pun intended. So, if you want to look at, the, let's look back at their most recent numbers. Uh, they reported on May 18th, and they report they reported 14.19 uh, earnings per share in uh, Q1 versus an estimate of 12.79. So, a pretty big, massive um, beat. Uh, they also reported $3.7 billion of revenue, which is up 113% uh, year over year from last year's uh, comparable quarter. So obviously two phenomenal uh, earnings beats. They also raised guidance. Um, their EBITDA, they raised it to about $8 billion from a previous guidance of 7 to $7.5 billion, which in this market, nobody's raised in guidance or they have no reason to. Uh, but having said that, this company did, and they did it in a massive way. So I think that there's uh, obviously some, you know, there's some tailwinds here. Another, uh, if you look at uh, some other numbers, their uh, their operating cash flow in the first ha- first nine months of 2021 was just under four billion, and then they're and then uh, at the end of the uh, year, their their fourth quarter was um, two billion. So they actually got up to a six billion dollar. Um, Cash flow. So if you look at the trend, like they 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 increase in the back and the back half of the year, and then their first quarter cash flow in um, in 2020 and 2022 was almost 1.7 billion. So you see each quarter they seem to be going higher and higher, and you know management has indicated that even this, this stronger growth is probably going to continue and even be higher this quarter. So as you see, the trend is your friend, even in a a, a market where things seem to be slowing down everywhere else. There, there's not a uh, bear market in this sector. In fact, in, in fact just the opposite. Um, and and the, the thing that really uh, that really stands out to me is their, uh, not just their stellar growth, but their dividend yield. Last March, they, report, they reported and paid out a $17 dividend to all their shareholders. Plus, if you add that to the $2.5 uh, dollar dividend they paid in November, that's nineteen and a half dollars for a seventy dollars stock, so it's massive. And all roads, if you look, if you look at uh, historical trends and what they're doing, what they're saying, it's probably leading to a higher dividend in the short ter- term. So if you're looking at that, you're looking at somewhere between a ten to twenty percent dividend increase in, uh, increase over last years, and a couple with no leverage with no leverage at all. Um, they either have to do one of two things. They're either going to pay out, they increase their dividend payout ratio, or they're going to um, use uh, these these growth investments and, and increase their earnings going forward. Now, you know, I, I, you know, there's no guarantee in what dividends are, but I mean, it, this with massive uh, guidance, uh, if that continues, I could easily see a scenario where they pay out more than 30% of their dividends with the stock at the current price here. Now, should that, now what obviously would happen there is the stock would probably rally here, but you know it seems that there's no reason why the uh, the stock shouldn't go higher, or you're or even if it doesn't, you're just gonna ha- you're gonna be paid out a massive dividend one way or another. So um, I, I, there, there's really not a lot to dislike here, and this is the kind of uh, position if even if it was even on weakness, something I would add to. So in terms of structure. Um, since they're not going to pay out the huge dividend to later in the year, I do like the August. I, l- I want to buy a call spread out to August. August will actually be, um, 
incorporate the next earnings uh, date, which is, I believe, estimated at this time to be August 16th. So just looking at the uh, August structure, I like the August 70, 100 call spread. I think the stock could easily get to that um, in the next three months as some of these, um, as uh, the uh, the um, bottlenecks um, calm down a bit. If you look at the option chain here, it looks like you can pay around $7 to the August 70 call and sell the August 100 crawl for about 75 cents. So about six and a quarter, um, six and $6.25 cents where the call spread could be worth uh, up to $30. So if you back out the uh, uh, premium paid, you get almost a four to one payoff for a name that I think uh, is a uh, very cheap name and something with massive upside here. Well, guys, I think we'll finish up the show there. It's been it's been another fantastic uh, episode to get you guys on on. Um, always insightful to hear how you guys kind of build your trade ideas and then you know go through the structures, how you think you they might play out or how you want to play them out in your own portfolios. Um, and also really appreciate you both giving um, your sharing your thoughts on the the current environment uh, and you know the market stuff that you talk through. I think very useful for myself, but obviously for our viewers as well. So uh, really appreciate that, guys. And uh, speaking of you guys watching our viewers, there's a few things I wanted to mention uh, that might be of interest to you in terms of upcoming ITPM events over the next month or so, through the month of June anyway. Uh, the first of which is for our uh, new uh, ITPM sort of students or people that are new to ITPM at least. We have a webinar coming up on the 2nd of June on Thursday, uh, which is uh, the secrets of the ITPM Thailand mentoring program. Um, I think that will be a great one to get some insight into what goes on in those mentoring programs and, and what the guys kind of learn. Um, and then for our alumni students, we've got another webinar on the 4th of June, which is the Saturday. Uh, that is entitled Getting Ready for More Pain Trades, very apt given the current market environment that we're all trading through. And I believe uh, Ben is actually hosting that one. So that promises to be a really, really good one uh, for you guys to, to learn some information from. Aside from that, towards the end of the month, so the end of June, we've got an ITPM half year conference. Now, the uh, conferences that we do at ITPM are uh, webinar conferences at the moment, typically all day events where the ITPM senior trading mentors that you see on What's, you, What's On Your Mind uh, talk through various trading topics. And this time we've also got our managing partner, Anton Creel, talking about some stuff as well. So um, that'll be a really interesting event to attend as well. Uh, given the, the current environment that we're in, it is pretty oversubscribed. Places are going quite quickly. So if you're interested in that, do sign up uh, as soon as you can. So that's it really for this episode. If you do want to sign up to any of those webinars, then you can go to our website, itpm.com and uh, sign up from there. But yeah, as I said, that's it for this episode. And I look forward to welcoming you guys back for another episode of What's On Your Mind in a couple of weeks time.